Victor's mood was improving minute by minute. It was improving because Inga had such a decisive and serious and well thought out approach to having a baby. And also because she wanted to have his baby. And also because it wasn't some materialistic, flighty woman who would give birth to his future son. He'd seen in the dreams. In the dream. But Inga, who was approaching this so seriously and responsibly, and he so wanted to do something really nice for Inga, whom he already considered the mother of his future son. Victor stood up, quickly put on his suit, went up to Inga and solemnly pronounced these words. Inga, marry me. Of course I'll marry you, Inga answered matching Victor's tone and fastening her robe. Our son should have official parents, but there's no point in us going on a honeymoon cruise to fashionable resorts. That doesn't fit in with my plan for preparing for the birth of our child. Well, what does fit? Where can we get the positive emotions? We need to go around to the neighboring villages and find a spot that feels right to us. It should be a spot that would be pleasing to you and to me, and thus to our son. When he sees it, we'll buy a hectare of land there, and you'll build a little house in which we need to conceive our child. I'll be in that spot for the whole nine months, leaving it for short times, perhaps. We'll plant a garden of young trees on our land. I'll give birth to our son, not in a maternity ward, but in our family homestead, in the little house. Victor couldn't believe that Inga, the striking young woman who used to so love going to fancy nightclubs and popular resorts, was capable of changing her way of life so drastically. On the one hand, he was flattered by Inga's plans. After all, she was thinking about his child. But on the other hand, wasn't there something a little abnormal about this plan? He heard from one of his friends about some books that talk about an unusual way of preparing for childbirth. His friend told him about how important it was for every family to have its own hector of land and gave him a book with a green cover entitled The Family Book. He hadn't had time to read it, but he'd heard that there was a very passionate response to these books in society. The people who read them were starting to change the way they live. Victor's gaze suddenly fell on a stack of books on the nightstand, books with green covers, he went over and read the name of the series, The Ringing, the Ringing Cedars of Russia, and the family book was among them. Victor realized that Inga had taken all her unusual ideas about preparing for the birth of their child and about the birth itself from these books and was planning to follow them precisely. But he wasn't so sure. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Inga's unusual and unquestioning certainty put him on his guard. It was as if some invisible, be invisible being had transformed her views of life as we knew it, as we know it, her worldview. But had these books transformed Inga for the better or had they made her a little bit strange? Victor asked himself these questions over and over and he began putting up some resistance. Inga, I know that you got your ideas from these books. I've heard of them. Some people think they're marvelous, and some people say there are a lot in them that you can't prove, that it's all a fairy tale. Maybe you shouldn't believe everything written in them so blindly. Think about it. Why should we get some plot of land, build a little house on it, and disfigure ourselves by planting some trees. 
with the money I have, we can buy ourselves a good mansion with already landscaped grounds, a pool and grass, some little paths and garden, if that's what you really want. Sure, you can buy a lot of things, even simulated love, but I want us to plant our garden ourselves. And got blurted out, agitated for some reason. All on our own, because when our son gets bigger, I want to be able to say to him, Do you see that apple tree, son? And that pear tree? And that cherry tree? I planted them myself and watered them way back when you were just an infant. I did that for you. You were just a little thing. And the trees were just little things too. Now if you've grown a bit and they've grown up too and they've started bearing fruit for you and I've strived to make the whole space around your small motherland nice and pretty for you. Victor found Inga's ardent speech was convincing. He liked it. He even began to feel bad that no one in his life could take him to a garden like that and say to him, your parents put in this garden and grew it for you. Yes, of course Inga was right. But why was she only talking about herself, her, herself as if he didn't even exist? Victor thought, and he acts in a slightly offended tone. But Inga, when our son gets a little bigger, why are you only going to talk to him about yourself? Well, because you don't want to put in a garden. Inga replied calmly. What does that mean? You don't want to. I so want to do it, if it's necessary for our future. All right, so then, if we're going to do everything together, then I'll say to our son, your father and I put in this garden for you. Exactly right, Victor replied, calming down. For two months, they spent every weekend driving through the countryside, outside the city, in search of a spot to build their family homestead. This was a fascinating way to spend their time. And at that moment, it seemed to Victor that nothing in life was more important than searching out the one spot in the world that would be pleasing to his soul, and thus his future sons too. And one day, they happened to stop on the outskirts of a run-down little village, 30 kilometers outside the city. Inga was the first to get out of the car. This is it, she said quietly. I feel something here too, replied Victor. Then they came back to the spot again later and spent the whole day there, surveying the territory and talking with local residents. They learned that the soil there wasn't so very fertile and it had a high water table. But that didn't put Victor off. Every day he had a stronger and stronger feeling that this land and the little birches growing on it, the sky and the clouds above him, it all felt like his family, his and his future son his and Inga grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And if the land wasn't fertile, it didn't matter. He'd make it fertile. It didn't take long to formulize the purchase of two hectares of land and within four months, a beautiful little log house, just like something out of a fairy tale, already stood on their plot. Inside the little log house was a sauna, a composting toilet, hot and cold running water pump, right from a well. They dug on their land. On the second floor was a cozy bedroom with a window that looked out on a lake in the forest. Inga designed the interior of the little house and planned all the plantings on their plot. And she and Victor set out cedars firs and pines tree all along the perimeter of the plot perimeter of the plot along with little fruit tree saplings every evening victor would hurry home t 
to go. <clears throat> Victor would hurry home to his little house, to his future homestead, where the future mother of his child was bustling about getting the house in order. It wasn't just that all the women Victor had known before receded into the background. They simply no longer exist for him. Inga's unconventional approach to bearing a child gave birth to a new feelings, to new feelings in him too. Maybe he didn't fully understand them yet. They didn't really feel like ordinary love. But he knew for some that he'd never be able to leave her and that only she, that only with her could he build a future. They went on Moscow together to attend classes on home birth. There was one strange thing about Inga that confused him. She categorically refused to be intimate with him, explaining that the child shouldn't come into the world as a result of desire of the flesh but as a result of an immeasurably larger and more meaningful human desire. Really though, the author of these books had gone too far, not as a result of desire of the flesh. Is something like that really possible? But one day, but one day when he was lying in bed next to Inga, having already given up hope of having sex with her, and was just lying there thinking about their future son, he happened to touch Inga's breast, and she suddenly pressed herself to him and embraced him. In the morning, as Inga still lay sleeping, Victor went to the lake, and he noticed that the world around him was totally different now, unusual and joyful, never before had he experienced what he'd experienced the night before, not with Inga, not with any other woman. It was not ordinary sex. It was an inspired burst of creation. People are born and people die. But if they go through life without experiencing this, then they're missing out on what just may be the most important thing in life. But thanks to Inga, he hadn't missed out on this most important thing. And some new feelings arose in him now. A new, even blazing feelings of warmth toward the soul woman in his life, Inga. Except for the rare trip to the city, Inga spent the entire nine months of her pregnancy on the homestead. She planned out where she put the baby carriage in the crib, and she even made Victor plant a small grassy area where their little son could walk. Her labor began a week before she was due. It looked as if their future son was in a hurry to come into this beautiful earthly space. From the information gleaned, in the childbirth classes, Victor knew what a father needed to do to help during labor. But the only truly helpful thing he managed to do was summon a midwife. They knew and called the paramedics just in case. So Inga ended up having to be having to fill the bathtub with water herself. Get a towel ready and check the water temperature. Victor, meanwhile, just rushed around the room. He remembered that there was something important he should be doing, but for the life of him, he couldn't remember what it was. Inga, not counting on her husband's help, climbed into the bathtub on her own. The contractions grew longer, but as she strained, nothing but joyful triumphs notes rang out in her beautiful voice. Out of everything he'd heard in the classes, Victor finally remembered one thing. He remembered about positive emotions. Glancing at the windowsill, he caught sight of a flower Inga had planted. It was blooming. He grabbed this pot with the flower and ran into the bathroom with it. 
repeating in excitement. Look, Anga, your flower bloom, your flower bloom, it bloom. Just look at it. It was standing there like that, flower pot in hand, when his son with his little body appeared on the tub. The midwife arrived when Inga had already placed this tiny body on its stomach. Seeing Victor standing there holding the flower pot, the midwife quickly asked him, What are you doing? Giving birth to my son, Victor answered. Ah, I see. The midwife replied knowingly, well then, how about if you put your flower pot on the windowsill and bring me? I have to tell all the guys, Victor thought, racing all around the little house. True eternal love arises only when you and your beloved give birth to your long-awaited child. <laughs>